Hello! Hi! <laughs> Welcome to YouTube Microbiology Journal Club, where we nerd out about big, about all things small. <laughs> my name is Danny, and in a previous life, I dropped out from my PhD in microbiology at the University of Chicago, where I was infecting skin I grew with MRSA. <laughs> Nowadays, I'm a fact checker for pharmaceutical advertisers and the president of Biotech Without Borders, a nonprofit based in NYC, dedicated to enabling the public with tools for biotech. <clears throat> My name is Faz, and in a previous life, I got my PhD in microbiology from Imperial College London, where, among other things, I was making flesh-eating bacteria glow in the dark. I've also worked as a research and integrity specialist, and these days I'm an editor for an acad academic journal, and also a science comedian who tries to make science fun and accessible. But this is my day off, so buckle up for some hyper-nerdiness. <laughs> so every week we meet to talk about microbiology. Today is our deep dive week where we look at each figure in the papers that we chose last week and criticize the scientific findings. It's a journal club and we encourage our audience to leave us questions and comments. Next week will be our news week where we survey a bunch of articles to choose an article for the next deep dive. So make sure to subscribe to satisfy your microbiology curiosities. <laughs> so you can follow us along, uh, follow along with the papers we discuss either week in our shared Zotero drive, uh, linked in the doobly doo below. And we do want to hear from you, so please use the comments to or tweet us using the micro TWGJC hashtag, which is down there in the doobly doo. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And we can. Uh, so this week we are we've chosen two <laughs> double double header. Um, <laughs> Because I think it, we, we said last week it'd be interesting to compare between these two things. Uh, we have both the Chadox vaccine from AstraZeneca, uh, an interim analysis, as well as the uh, Pfizer vaccine, BNT162B2. Yeah. Yeah, we've been trying to cover a lot of news around these vaccines, and a lot of it has been pre delivered by press release rather than actual peer-reviewed literature. So finally, mm -hmm. in the past two weeks, we've actually got some stuff that we can get our teeth on. And the great thing about scientific papers is they generally provide a lot more detail about how the data was collected, analyzed, and how the researchers actually reached their conclusions. And now is the our opportunity to actually get a chance to cut through all that hearsay and get to the actual paper. Yeah, it was great. I mean, <laughs> there's definitely a lot to read. I didn't read those full protocols, but if you if you guys are interested, the full protocols are linked there. Um, you can go through and see exactly uh, what they had submitted to the regulatory agencies, and there are very technical ways of approaching um, the study design. But uh, we do have like a little summary slide uh, just to help people through. Yeah, um, that's below. Uh, yeah, you know, I. What I was surprised is I just like put these in an image search to try to find like the most relevant images. And for this Chadox one, uh, you know, it's just like some Portuguese uh, <laughs> group that like put this together. And I thought this just like is the most succinct way to think about it, right? right. What is the vaccine? It is a DNA construct that encodes the S protein. It's fused to um, a tissue plasminogen activator leader sequence that's sort of to secrete it uh, maybe to like put it into the endoplasmic reticulum in some way um, and it's delivered into human cells by this uh, non-replicating chimpanzee adenovirus vector and so you can see the nice diagram you know dna encodes it goes into a person that cell infects something then your cell starts making the spike uh, immune cells see it and hopefully you get antibodies <clears throat> right and then we've got the uh, the second paper that we're covering, which is the mRNA-based uh, vaccine, so BNT162B2. Uh, we've actually covered like a, a version of this, so we covered the BNT162B1 in the phase one trials, yes. but then they mm -hmm. ditched that and went through this version <laughs> because, because you know, we, we we didn't care about that version too much. We didn't invest an entire YouTube video into talking about it, but no, we, they went off. To, that was just the RBD portion, whereas this one is like the full uh, spike protein. Which, yeah, you know, and it seems like they did some sort of modification to it, right? So it's in its pre-fusion stabilized confirmation, so it doesn't, like, I guess, fuse to anything. Yeah, that, um, yeah. that's <laughs> useful. And that's also the way that it looks on the actual SARS-CoV-2 variant. So it, it mm -hmm. is, so you want to have, like, because they're never going to see, like, the fusion confirmation. That only exists for maybe a few seconds, or so right. it's not going right. to, so yeah. Um, Oh, but I do think it's interesting to think from this standpoint, right? Because we've talked about this before with those mutations and there's the RBD and it kind of can hang around, right? Yeah. There's also post-processing and after-processing. I don't know how this one stacks up actually to that, but like, you know, they've chosen a very specific lump of protein and tried to stabilize it in that confirmation. Um, there is some flexibility, right, inside yeah. of the, the, the molecule that we know. 
Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, and this is lipid nanoparticles. So yeah. actually, very similar to the other candidate that's out there in the races <laughs> for the vaccine Olympics. Yeah. Right. Uh, the Moderna vaccine. Yeah, we've <laughs> just got an emergency use author use authorization. Or, emergency use authorization today. Uh, we still haven't seen oh, a wow. paper from them yet, but uh, yeah. so for the U.S. so far, but. Um, again, they we talked about them as well because they've also done a lot of work on sRNA candidates, um, mm-hmm. and yeah. So this is M- but, mRNA candidates. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> mRNA candidates. Gosh, damn, I get all confused, all muddled. Uh, yeah. Um, so we're going to be covering two papers. The first paper we're going to be covering is going to be called the safety and efficacy of the Chadox NCoV nineteen vaccine brackets AZD one twenty two like one two two two. Uh, again, they really tried to rebrand. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but not, I guess, not actually that successfully because we're still calling it Chadox. <laughs> yeah. Um, against SARS-CoV-2, an interim analysis of four randomized control trials in Brazil, South Africa, and the UK. Uh, so yeah, just to recap the Chadox one vaccine. So uh, it's from a chimpanzee adenovirus, and they've taken the blueprint from the for the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. I've, d- I've depicted the spike protein as a hand because obviously the spike protein's job is to bad touch your cells. And so <laughs> it's a creepy hand and, and they take the DNA from that and they put it in the Chadox 1. A and... creepy hand <laughs> that's, been, uh, that's been refined through evolution. <laughs> yes, refined through evolution. Like our hands were not... My, oh, my hand was not refined through evolution. <laughs> uh, but yeah... Um, in f- and the thing, great thing about it is that it almost simulates a SARS-CoV-2 infection by integrating into the cell and making the cell make the protein so that mm-hmm. the, the immune system will encounter it in almost the same way that it would encounter the real version of SARS-CoV-2. So Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think this is interesting, like, like, sort of calling back to some episodes we've done with that, uh, with different receptors, is that adenovirus has some sort of tissue tropism. So actually, yeah. like, <laughs> if the adenovirus is going to you know, have its own cells that it wants to infect. But, um, you know, all, all that matters is that we get an immune response somehow, right? Like, right. it might not be the same cells that um, SARS-CoV-2 infects, but as long as the immune system thinks that this is a bad thing, then uh, we'll get some sort of response. <laughs> yeah, and viewers might be asking, why a chimpanzee virus? And the re- reason for that is because chimpanzee viruses infect chimpanzees, but... People have been working on human adenoviruses. So one of the other vaccine candidates that has been approved in China is called CanSino. No, that's based on a human adenovirus. But the problem is, the human immune system has seen that adenovirus before. So the moment the vaccine goes in, the, the immune system can clear it out before it is able to infect cells and the, yeah. thus cause a response to spike. So that's less effective. So the thought was that if they go for this chimpanzee adenovirus that doesn't infect humans usually, and in this case it's been made to not replicate, so it can't infect mm-hmm. humans still. But it can still enter into the cells. The immune system won't recognize one time, it. One time use. <laughs> yeah, one, one time, time use. Viral code. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that the other. I think. Uh, I mean, not that there's been a lot of good information about this vaccine, but the Gamela, the, the Russian vaccine, yeah. is also an adenovirus vector, uh, not chimpanzee. It's a human adenovirus. Yeah. But but we know very little about how that one works. Yeah, we know that that's a two for the price of one deal where they do use two different adenoviruses. So odds are you're not going to be immune to both of them. So mm-hmm. I mean, and Johnson yeah, Johnson... so they're they are addressing that as well, right? The idea yeah. of the immunity, pre-existing immunity. Yeah. Um. So yeah, on to Wait, you're going to say something about Johnson and Johnson. Oh yeah, Johnson and Johnson have like an adenovirus twenty six vaccine that they're that people are very like impressed with because it did really well in the uh, primate studies because. It apparently mm-hmm. could create like immune response just from like one shot, which was a very impressive primates, but it's not in humans, so we don't know what to, how to judge that. I mean, yeah, yeah, especially when we think about humans like being uh, pre-existingly immune to something, and like that's basically the opposite scenario, right? We've given human adenovirus into chimpanzees. Yeah, and also like the 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 rhesus macaques sorry uh the oh, rhesus yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't use chimpanzees for research properly anymore i think uh, um but rhesus macaques that are also naturally not really they're kind of already resistant to SARS-CoV-2 so they don't get as sick as humans so again there are lots of things that i mean if we're looking at chadox they if, i mean i think we're looking back at that paper that i remember at the time I was quite critical of it because it it while it did re- kind of reduce severe symptoms, it didn't do much for asymptomatic carriage. So mm-hmm. that 
So maybe this will change change my mind and make me a little. Well, the thing is, now we're moving into humans. We're actually going to see how it how yeah. works in a real setting. So absolutely, yeah. This is this is the data in which we can really assess its utility inside of the, the human population. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, sorry, I sidetracked you. So you were talking about uh, we're basically sort of we're getting an infection from these modified uh, viral particles, and then that makes our cells express the creepy hand. Yeah, the creepy hand, and then the immune cells see the creepy hand, and they learn to recognize that in the future. I'm super simplifying it, by the way. So, yep. Yep. so like the idea would be a T cell would would spot it, or be like, or a dendritic cell would like somehow grab it, but some form of immune system would would be able to recognize that something's going wrong, and then that would like cause some proliferation, and there'd be more of the immune cells who are able to recognize that for future. So that mm -hmm. when, if you get infected with the SARS, the, your immune system will recognize it faster, and they'll already have a response ready to deal with it, and a response that's, and a response that's appropriate as well. Totally. Uh, yeah, so diving into table S1, I suppose? <clears throat> yes, so this study covers four clinical trials, so Two are in the UK, and one is in Brazil, and one is in South Africa. And these are all ongoing, but... Um, so, interesting things that I want to, to highlight is that only two of them have reached the... are being analysed for efficacy. Uh, because uh, one of the ones in the UK hasn't got enough page... Well, the UK one and the South African one, so COV-001 and COV-005, they don't have enough people who have been infected yet to get efficacy results. Yep. Yeah, that's great. I mean, remember, this is the interim... This we're looking at interim results for the Chadox vaccine. They're sort of rushing to show us information, you know, hot on the heels of the first approved, right, uh, Pfizer vaccine. So uh, it's understandable that we won't see the full data set. Um, I, I, it's, I think it's cool that the control group gets a vaccine as well. <laughs> yeah, they get meningitis uh, ACY. Because I don't know, have, have you ever seen that on social media? Because one of the side effects of people getting the COVID vaccine is not shutting about, up about getting the COVID vaccine. And... <laughs> One of the things that people post on social media is that, oh, I've been in the trial. I know I definitely got the vaccine because I have a side effect. Yeah, that's, oh, yeah. But, <laughs> but, I mean, so again, that, that kind of means that patients can be unblinded if that if that happens. So, mm -hmm. so having the meningitis vaccine, which has its own set of like, vaccine-related side effects, means that that kind of ensures that patients are better blinded. Yeah. Uh, also, I was just going to say, like, side effect or not, like, you can still get a placebo side effect, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> placebo effect is extremely powerful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you catch a cold on the same day as you, as you get the viral vaccine, or celebrate your vaccine with a pizza party and a slightly acts intolerant, then you'll get certain <laughs> symptoms, so, I mean... <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Okay, and, and then what do we have? Table 12 here. <laughs> yeah, table S12. 12. Table S12, where... We're looking at the um, okay, so uh, so for a number of like uh, manufacturers, there are a number of different manufacturers of this vaccine. So they partnered with uh, three companies: so CBF, Advent, and Cobra, Cobra slash Symbiosis. So Symbiosis did some of the work for Cobra, and uh, so this is quite kind of interesting. So they, they in the protocol they do go into like how this vaccine was actually manufactured. Um, uh, so. Um, one of the interesting point things at least yeah. so, oh, well so i guess i can i'll briefly speak to the manufacturers since this yeah. may be our opportunity oh, so yeah, like yeah manufacturers they have a dna construct right it has the adenovirus genome that they've changed so it can't do any replication anymore mm. um i think specifically they like remove the parts of the genome that uh, create some of the replication machinery and they replace that with spike protein because you know we want the spike protein in there um, so that, that construct, it's just made of DNA, it gets transformed into a cell line, um, and then the cell line, they, they call it, the term is called rescued, right? Like, they rescue the virus, like a damsel inside of the genome. Um, they basically add, like, um, uh, some sort of inducer, it could be like a helper virus, I, I don't recall what it actually is in their case, I think it's just an inducer, they maybe mm. use tetracycline, and then that uh, kickstarts like one round of replication, um, and it packages up the genomes that are in there. But of course, those genomes, they aren't the real genomes, <laughs> they're this modified version that we have, um, and then you do a bunch of purification steps, probably ultra centrifugation is one of the techniques they would use, mm. spin it down really fast, and all the heavy stuff goes down, and and the viral particles, which are heavy, but not that heavy, kind of float in a band, mm. and then they're able to siphon that off. 
Um, okay, yeah, so three different companies are doing this work for us. <laughs> yeah, interesting, like some of them have different storage needs, so this, so some of them are being very careful. So CBF and Advert versions, they, they, they're they not taking any chances. They want you to, to store at 8 minus 80, whereas Cobra, I mean, they want it to be stored at regular fridge temperatures, uh, which has been really interesting because they've been marketing this as fridge stable, so it's quite interesting that they're, yeah. they're taking extra care. Um, hmm. I think that that's to me that's a cover your ass thing coming from the yeah. manufacturers, right? They're saying keep it cold because we haven't tested <laughs> whether or not we can have those excursions into lower temperatures. Um, yeah, but maybe the other ones they either don't care that they haven't done the testing or that they're okay with those excursions because that's what that's what we've shown in the main body of the text. <laughs> Yeah, and it's the, one of the important things is to make sure every patient gets the same dose. So the dose they're aiming for was uh, 5 times 10 to the 10, which is about 50 billion virus particles per dose. Uh, but how do you measure virus particles in a, in a vaccine? There are, so, so let's... Yeah, uh, they're invisible, right? Like they're tiny, <laughs> yeah. tiny invisible things. They basically, when, when yeah. you do all these purification steps, it's just like white liquid, right? Clear liquids. That's uh, the big joke from yeah. <laughs> working in a lab. Right? Like a lot of molecular biology is just moving clear liquids from small tubes into other liquids, uh, into other clear liquids and small tubes. Yeah, it's disappointing after you've like watched CSI your whole life. And you hope that at least some of the liquids will fl like fluoresce or do something crazy, but nope, it's yeah. just making sure <laughs> you, you don't know when you've gone wrong until maybe about a week later and then you're like, oh, because I did that. Yeah, so it's right. frustrating working in molecular biology, but um, good, yeah, so more how do they do it? Yeah. How are they going to mess this stuff for us? So yeah. Anyway, so so how do they count cells? So one of the options is using quantitative PCR. So this uh, uses a polymerase to replicate a specific viral sequence, and if that sequence isn't there, you won't get a signal. So it needs the viral genome to be present, and then. It... And this is, this is how we do our diagnostics, or this is the gold standard for our diagnostics right now. Yeah, yeah. It replicates a sequence over and over again until it runs out of ingredients. So that's when it reaches a saturation point, and so the more. Uh, the more genome you have initially, the the more the quicker it is you get to that saturation point. Because um, I'm trying to think of a bad analogy that I can <laughs> have for this. Okay, so uh, <laughs> if I have to like if I go to a burger restaurant and I eat all the burgers there, I'm full up much quicker than if I have to cook the burgers myself. So um, <laughs> bad so. analogy, making things more confusing than they are. Um, but yeah, the I, idea is that if so if there's very few. Uh, original genomes there, then a lot of, most of that will be like, it'll reach saturation much slower, and if there's, so it's a good way of like counting genomes, the only problem is uh, you have to destroy your sample in order to do a count, yep. and it's kind of time consuming and kind of expensive, which brings us yep. to our second uh, strategy, spectrophotometry, using like a light to, to shine through the vaccine, and the amount of like, and as it goes through, it's dimmed. So UV light is absorbed by uh, D DNA, which is why you shouldn't be out in the sun if too long, because UV light absorbs the D D yep. DNA and breaks it and gives you cancer. But in this case, we use that, that thing for good. So we can use that to, to measure how much DNA UV light is absorbed in order to estimate how much uh, uh, DNA there is present. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So. Yeah, so probably the approach here, right, like this is like a calibration, like they'll do spectrophotometry on a bunch of the different samples, they'll test a few right along that concentration gradient, and then they'll say, okay, every time we manufacture stuff and we do uh, spectrophotometry, we get these numbers, that correlates with these qPCR numbers, so we're not going to do qPCR on everything, right, like we'll just do spec, right, on the key sort of steps to make sure that we have this amount of viral particle. Yeah, the there is only like one wrinkle to this is that mm -hmm. that other chemicals can absorb UV light in the same sort of region. So these vaccine formulations have a lot of different other like com components that can uh, absorb UV. So yep. one one example that they definitely they try to keep an eye on is polysorbate eighty, which uh, can can also absorb in the same spectrum area. If there's too much of it in there, then it'll make you think that you've got more DNA in your sample than you actually have. Right. Um, and that can be a, a real problem, which is kind of something that that happened in this. Uh, so, so it happened in this study. I, so, in one of the groups, they uh, noticed that some of their measurements were a bit off. So, in the COV002, they they realized that one of the groups had uh, I'm quoting the paper here, lower than anticipated re reactogenicity profile, and 
This was noted in the trial, and the unexpected... So that means... Sorry, that would mean that they took blood from those people and they were measuring neutralize they're measuring neutralizing antibodies yes. right and then they're like oh it's kind of weird we thought we gave them this much all the other people have been making this amount of antibodies but these people are making less <laughs> yeah they they noted that this this was due to the unexpected interference of an excipient within the sp spectrophotometry assay um and so they don't tell you, you us what the excipient is. I've just made a random guess that it's polysorbate because that's something that is, right. is in the it's used in lots of different vaccines. It's used in this formulation, and it is known to if you add too much to it, it will just throw off your readings, even if it doesn't. I mean, yeah. And and it's not so much that it'll. It's like the sometimes it's like the amount of that's in the sample. So it's yeah, it's yeah. It's, so I mean, what to me it means that like it's somewhere in their process of. Like, they made a tool, right, to mm. correlate spectrophotometry with qPCR. But that tool was made under very specific circumstances, right? Mm. And probably what happened is they extended that tool, right, to be like, oh, and we can also use it here. But they didn't realize that if they used it there, it meant that there was a little something else inside of the mixture, and that thing it would absorb as well. And so because that isn't in the calibration, the original calibration, then the calibration's off. And so they only discovered that after they gave it to people, which is like a big, it's quite unfortunate, actually. Yeah, it's quite. Yeah. So from the qPCR readings, they found that they basically gave them about like half the dose. So about 2.5 billion uh, virus particles, 25 billion virus particles, which is about what they wanted to give to children for their testing doses. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in the almost, well, yeah. Uh, oh, I just want to say, so then in this in this whole trial, they will be saying lo, S, SD and LD, mm. <laughs> right, as as the way that um, differentiates these doses, right? They have the long dose and short dose, I think is what they're calling. Lo, low, low dose. dose. And, yeah, low dose. And but standard dose. Oh, standard dose, yes. <laughs> yeah, the, there's, there's a bit of confusion because I know that they, they also had other groups where they... They were originally going to give them this one dose, and they decided later to give them the second dose because they weren't getting the. They, yeah. they so that so, so those got a longer gap between their original and standard the the, the standard doses, mm -hmm. and I think the, this might have been in the LDS SD group as well, but I mean the LDS group is like taking lemons they were given and trying to make lemon lemonade out of them, and they actually make quite good lemonade. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can do the analysis like in a like. I, and you'll see they've done their subgroup analysis, right, to kind mm. of allay our concerns about any sort of issues that may have occurred here. Um, but yeah, I guess just to remember <laughs> that when you're reading this, that yeah, there are sort of two cohorts within COVID in the COVID two trial. <laughs> yeah, uh, that. that had a bit of a hiccup <laughs> in terms of the dose that they received. They had a low dose in their first dose, and then they rectified it. <laughs> yeah. So that actually brings us to the table uh, one, which is our, our baseline characteristics. Mm -hmm. So pretty typical inside of a clinical trial, right? You want to see who is taking our vaccine, right? who did we sample from the, the full population? Um, and it's really interesting to read like the inclusion criteria and just hear that like they were enrolling a lot of healthcare workers, mm. for example, right? In, yeah. In the Brazilian trial I, I read. Um, oh, actually, no, in, in all, all trials, them, yeah. All yeah um and and again but like these baseline i think that this where this is where you can really get it to dive into the weeds a little mm. and see well look at kobe 2 right they probably enrolled everybody to be equivalent to all their other kobe trials mm. but because they had this little hiccup it fractures their population yeah. right and that um, there's a covariate between uh, there's there's a baseline demographics right potential contribution uh, that will confound the information that we get when we're trying to compare standard dose standard dose versus low dose standard dose. Oh yeah, I mean if you look in the LDSD group, there's the big thing is a uh, is 18 to 55 years old, which means uh, which completely changes. So if you look at the underlying like diseases in this group. Half the rate of cardiovascular disease, half the rate of diabetes, yep. and half the rate of lung problems. So yeah. it's all probably from that age difference, right? Yeah. Like a, a, that's probably a huge driver to to anything we see there. Yeah. So that's going to be very, very important how we interpret the data from that group. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, but yeah. But, but but in general, like I, I don't think like nothing seems very strange. In, like maybe comparing. 
the the Kobe three group with the Kobe two group, at least the bigger one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one thing I did notice is since the majority of these people are healthcare and social workers, one thing weird things I noticed is, is that there aren't many obese people in this uh, cohort, and mm. obesity mm. is a risk factor for uh, for COVID. Yeah, yeah, a risk factor for all sorts of com com comorbidities as well, right? Which add their complications uh, when we're talking yeah. about infectious disease. <laughs> and it's something that people haven't really been talking about. I mean, I, I was like, I did talk to a, like someone who worked in a morgue whose first comment was very un PC, but basically saying to the point, there's there was a lot of obese people in this cohort of dead people, and uh, it seems like we should be looking at this bit more because, I mean, sure. forty percent of the U people in the UK are like, like obese, um, so. That's a big part of the population. We shouldn't ignore that. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely uh, adds that risk. Like when we're thinking about in the public health setting, right? Like to yeah. warn people about these things. It's like it dovetails nicely with the idea of like healthy lifestyle, exercise, and so forth. Um, but then also in patient management for yeah. inside of hospitals, right? Like if it's a known thing that's going to send you down a bad path, then we should be looking at it. And also, um, like, we have to think about like they, they're already fat. I mean, so so they're already obese. You're not going to necessarily change that. Just think about what, how to treat them as they are, rather than because telling people to go to the gym isn't necessarily the most useful the way to just treat people absolutely. as they are. Maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sorry, I didn't imply. I didn't want to imply that. Like, that's what I was asking yeah. about. I was just saying, from the public health standpoint, it, it dovetails with those messages, right? So, like, yeah. I I see. For me, I've been seeing this whole pandemic as a, a big public health problem. Yeah. <laughs> right. And yeah. and and uh, you know, like sometimes there's unlikely allies in your fight against other public health yeah. issues. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, there's a lot of different things that are wrapped up in this. Um... <laughs> so, figure S1 yeah. is, um, this is like, I, I mean, I, it's kind of, this is not like the final one, because you would expect it to be, this is just their interim, right, mm. sort of flow chart of how everything goes. But you can see they have, like, this large number of people who are initially vaccinated spread amongst four different trials, um, and then they they show you that, oh, it splits into two groups, control versus vaccinated. Um, and then, look, I guess there's it's a kind of interesting. Some people get split off because they're in open label groups. Mm. So it means that they were told what they were taking. Um, and so they're not included in the analysis, of course, yeah. because like they're not with the blinded uh, group. Um, I didn't read what HIV cohorts were. Did you, did uh, you catch that? I didn't catch. Uh, I think like people who because they've got a separate one for hiv cohorts because they're a vulnerable population yeah so they didn't want to analyze those people either so mm. they're not included in this in the data that we'll be looking at um and then and then so that leaves a certain number who are um ready for analysis and then they remove a bunch because they basically don't hit um the right criteria that they pre-specified right in their in their statistical analysis to be eligible for analysis so there's a whole bunch of other people that get um set sent away <laughs> because they don't hit those basic criteria and that leaves us with the final values in these two trials that we will be looking at <clears throat> yeah so i think we'll go on to the the, the next slide which is table, the clinical progression still so this is like how do you tell what, whether someone's got a severe COVID disease or not? Um, so, so the question is like asymptomatic. So in this case, they they look for all the, whether they have the symptoms or not, and whether they uh, also have the uh, RNA test or I'm sorry, the nuclear acid test. They they say yeah. so they don't usually use what PCR because in, they're kind of like hedging for the fact that they they're working across multiple different hospitals and they might use multiple different tests as well. And there are going to yeah, be they they didn't want to restrict the enrollment right the the criteria yeah. based on new developments in diagnostic technology yeah <clears throat> and there are new tests coming out all the time so pe there is that need for for flexibility so they so in these studies you won't see pcr used so much you use see the naat which is nuclear acid uh amplification yeah amplification test amplification yeah. test yes <clears throat> Yeah, um, and I think they made a comment as well that they were using like an old, an older, more conservative definition of uh, disease in yeah. their in their trial because uh, you know like since we've had so many cases globally, like um, there there's an expanded list of potential um, side or sorry, mm. side effects uh, symptoms people can have, and so they were using like a more restrictive list of symptoms. <laughs> Yeah, and there are lots of people who get other things like the anosmia. There's 
uh, long COVID. There's a lot of other things. Um, yeah. Well, anosmia is in there. So oh, table okay. two, we move to the next one. This is their primary efficacy endpoint. And so I think, you know, for, for those who don't often read a lot of clinical study literature, right, like, uh, there's a lot of words that come from like the statistics of it all, right? Mm. Because at the end of the day, like really what we're doing is we're doing like a big statistical analysis, right? To look at the, the, the high level effects of a vaccine, right? Like hopefully to health relevant metrics, right? Inside of a human population. Um, so it's not really, uh, we don't get a lot of mechanistic information <laughs> from studies like this, right? We're getting like utility um, of a drug or an intervention, a vaccine in this case, in the population. Uh, primary efficacy then refers to, right, the the statistical like um, endpoint that the study is powered for. So on the back end, right, they've been doing all these like phase one, phase two studies. They're being like, oh, here's the effect size we see, right? We normally see people get better like this, right? how many people do we need in order to make sure that this gives us the highest statistical confidence, right? That what? And that's called the primary e efficacy. Mm. So they say over 15 days post the second dose, right? So you have to wait some time after you've had your second dose, PCR confirmed or NAAT confirmed SARS-CoV-2 with at least one of the following symptoms, right? So this is uh, fever, cough, shortness of breath, uh, asnosmia or without or no taste as well, agusia. <laughs> And um, yeah, so that's that is the definition of symptomatic COVID, right? That yeah. comes up positive, uh, and that's what they use. And so, so this all this all this all this work, right, is really giving us this one thing. And then everything else is kind of secondary, right? It's like interesting stuff that we also think is really useful, um, that is good for informing our decisions. But that's not what uh, the, <laughs> the primary statistical brunt of all of this work has been done for. Yeah. Um, yeah, and... and uh, the interesting, oh, yeah, they also, ahead. sorry, uh, asymptomatic patients as well is something very interesting. They, they delve into a little bit in this... Uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, like, along the way, so, like, this is, this is all about working with humans, right? Hmm. So, even though that's the one thing, right, that the whole study is set up for, then statisticians will go back and they'll say, okay, well, like, what can we show as well? <laughs> yeah. Right? And those will all get lumped into the secondary endpoints because treating people is like a huge step, right? Like you want to make sure we're getting the most data out of that. Like we go through all these different IRBs to make sure we're not wastefully treating animals with things, right? This is like even more so, right? Like let's make sure that we take this opportunity to get as much information out as possible. Um, and so, yeah, they designed in a bunch of other things. I was really happy that uh, the AstraZeneca people in their SARS or their COVI-002 trial, right, designed in uh, just regular, uh, well, actually, it's uh, people do it themselves in their yeah. homes, it seems like. They get ma <laughs> they, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, they get mailed a, a test and a, they get a little video to watch to show them how to administer the test. And <laughs> from that, they can send that to the main lab and then they get the, the main lab collects the data on whether they're asymptomatic or not. Yeah, and... I thought that was brilliant. I like really happy about that whole thing because that's like a very specific protocol built out. Um, in order to make sure that they can collect this very valuable data, which would be so laborious to collect if you had to ask these people to come into the lab yes. right, every day and take those things. Now they can just swab at home, they can send it in, and, and hopefully we can have some information as to how this particular vaccine right, is going to affect asymptomatic spread. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one there is one qualifier with this asymptomatic data is that there is some data that's missing. So... It's Scotland still, ha as part of the COVID-2 trial, they haven't turned over their data on asymptomatic patients. And also, another interesting thing, one of the advantages of working with healthcare workers is that they always get, they usually get regularly tested for COVID anyway. So mm -hmm. those tests haven't necessarily been incorporated into this analysis yet. So there is yep. a potential for there to be a lot more data coming on asymptomatic uh, transmission impacted yeah. by vaccines. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and yeah, I, I'm. This is probably the most the most exciting thing, right? Because like I already ranted like a little while back, right, about like how like none of these primary analysis take that into play, but here, yeah, there is a secondary analysis that is looking at it. Um, but yeah, like you can read from this table, their interim results. Uh, this is this is it, right? This is actually yeah. everything. <laughs> everything else is kind of like to me the window dressing, right? To like <laughs> to kind of like. Um, I mean, I think the safety one is another really important table that yeah. I look for when I'm reading this type of work. Mm. But, but yeah, I, 
mean, to me, it's all in a table, right? Because it's very, it's a lot of work, right? Just to, to come up with this, but this is from humans. And the endpoint that was chosen is something that, you know, we want to see that in the world. Yeah. Right? We want to see less people after being vaccined, um, test positive and have symptoms. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, so the big takeaways, uh, I mean, the thing that came out in the press releases was they, they talking about this low dose group having 90% efficacy. But, I mean, again, I think there are a lot of qualifiers to that. And overall... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but also, I think the other thing to remember, like, so you can see that vac- vaccine efficacy column, right? Is yeah. where you see all the exciting <laughs> percentages if people are excited about that sort of stuff. Um, but again, like, it's a tool. So, like, people said better than 50% is really, like, what you you know, is good mm. enough to deploy into the population, right? As long as there's not a lot of adverse events and we're seeing definitely better than those numbers here. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's that kind of teaser <laughs> with the 90% low dose uh, versus standard dose in the second one. Um, that's, and, and you know, when that news came out, people were saying like the best way to do that would be really to redo the trial, <laughs> right? Do the trial again with this, with this. I, I'm sure what they'll do is they'll just incorporate that into, um, into like they were doing children next or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, I mean, one thing I would like to see is actually that, com- like, cause at the moment it's not comparing like with like, I want to see like the. Age, age 18 to 55 in the other group in the standard dose standard dose and have that directly compared to the low dose standard dose because then that would get rid of a major confounder yeah yeah absolutely getting rid of the confounder is very important and also because we don't know if it will hold up when you add in those older people right yeah because mm. it could just be these people just respond better to the vaccine yeah as you said yeah uh so now we're going okay so also show that information in a kaplan meyer curve yes if we were mice <laughs> yep. <I> don't know. <laughs> so yeah this is interesting they present uh two two graphs so i mean they all looking at the difference between vaccinated and placebo groups so the placebo group is in blue and you can see there's lots of covid infections and you want the blue one to be higher than the l- red one i mean sorry the red one to be lower than the blue one yeah. um mm-hmm. Yeah, to because as you go higher up on this graph, like you basically have more people being infected by uh, yeah SARS-CoV-2. Although it's a huge, it's a very small percentage, as you can see, cumulative probability. Yeah. Uh, so they've got like data from the getting two doses, and they also can include data from just getting one dose. I, I believe in this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. This is a big thing that I was surprised to see in both papers. Is like a common secondary endpoint to choose is what's the efficacy after the first dose. Mm. <laughs> um, so that means that they're including events, right? Like that happen in that period, right? Between just getting it. So basically, um, they exclude less patients this way. Right. And uh, the exclusion, one would think, is like, I, I guess that's I, I was saying, oh, this is kind of a weird piece of data to show because it's like, oh, you can just get one. Right. Mm. But um, also the other thing that I didn't say when I was thinking about this is that the other thing that it shows is also just more patience. Right. Like there's yeah. a lot more patience that can be included in this analysis because they're not getting their. Uh, event like in that awkward period where you're really not sure like did they get the full dose like it doesn't have the full effect um you know at least they've had one uh and you can see more pay people yeah uh i guess it's a nice sanity check as well to say like they're not excluding like so many people in with their primary endpoint criteria that it really affects the overall gist of like the efficacy <clears throat> yeah and yeah, I think it's also like quite reassuring. I mean, I mean, it's good for them that because they they can prove that okay, two doses is definitely better than one dose. So you can't you, you have to buy both of them or else. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, they're not uh, in this one. It's the same scale, right? So we're not yeah. even seeing that it's better or worse, right? Like it looks the same actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd say I'd say right. they're in the same. I mean, the the single dose does seem to be like have slightly more mortality in in the yeah. vaccine group oh yeah in the vaccine group yeah, yeah. you can definitely see that bumps up yeah. yeah i was looking at the control group I'm like they look the same oh yeah <laughs> they should look the same they, they better look, look the same, same. <laughs> if they didn't look the same i'd riot <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah 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 sorry you're totally right yeah it, it does look much better that you get the full two doses yeah as as designed <laughs> yeah but i mean it's 
getting to reading pa- oh, now the next there's the next slide uh which is um delving into ldsd doses versus mm-hmm. S- yeah so this is that subgroup analysis right? yeah where they wanted to say, oh, look how great <laughs> the low dose looks, right? You can really see that profile is much improved, um, a very low line for the treated group. Uh, but again, we don't know how much of that is due to confounding factors as we saw in the baseline variables. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there's a lot that, it, the low dose standard dosing is more confusing than it is kind of helpful. Um, yeah. It, it gets it, I, I feel like it gives us a lot of like excitement, but I'm not really sure if that excitement is warranted, <laughs> right? I'm yeah. like, wow, it looks so great, but I'm just like, my scientist inside is just like, don't trust it. <laughs> it's like, they didn't, it kind of happened by accident. We see reasons in the baseline data that it, for simple reasons, right, that isn't about this dosing strategy, right, that could drive what we're, the, the phenomena we're seeing. So I'm, I'm trying to be tentative about it yeah because i feel like if i get if i get too happy about something it's just gonna it's gonna be like game, game of thrones where you're like oh yeah it's gonna everything's going right and that's when it is george R. R. martin just kills you all and that's what yeah. will happen if we believe in this vaccine too much <laughs> we have to be critical we have to be like kind of grimdark we have to be cynical about things yeah yeah i, I mean the vaccine works right yeah, like, it works maybe what's maybe the best thing to take away from seeing this two things is that it's not worse. Yeah. <laughs> right? The low dose doesn't make it a bad vaccine, right? Like, so at, at best it makes it better, but uh, let's not, let's not interpret that piece of information. Yeah. Right. We'll just, it's not worse. It's, it's not worse. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to say that we can save loads of money by just dividing the vaccines in half and giving it to people, but uh, yes, that's where we're getting into dangerous territory. Exactly. Right? Because, um, because like, if, if you're showing this information and now we're saying policymakers make decisions, well, like, they don't know for sure why this happened, but the public may be asking for things. Okay, anyways. Yeah. <laughs> That's why it's buried in figure S3, right? <laughs> like, they, yes. They, they want to show it, but they also don't want to show it for some reasons. <laughs> yeah, I think that there, there are definitely good re- good reasons to show it and good reasons to not show it. And I, I'm kind of erring on the, like, I'm glad I'm seeing it because I'm a scientist. All data is good data for me, but... <laughs> Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. happy to see it. We to... have to have like extreme skepticals when we're looking at this, yes. right? Um, and to me, the best takeaway in terms of like how it supports the main part of the paper, the primary efficacy point, right? Mm. Why this paper was done in the first place, right? Is that their little blunder with the low dose, <laughs> the low dose doesn't uh, significantly, wouldn't significantly affect the results to show bad results, yes. right? So like, that that's to me my takeaway. Okay, yeah. they made a mistake, right? And it, but that mistake is actually, if anything, it's in favor. But we don't even know, right? It's not to the detriment of the efficacy of the vaccine. Um, and so we can still move forward confidently, saying we have an effective vaccine on our hands here. Yeah, I'm <clears throat> glad to see this data. I'm just not so glad it went into a press release. That's the only thing that. Uh, I mean, that's like, you know, that is crazy to think about it, that the first thing that we saw from this paper was that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it definitely highlights the media circus environment that we're living in these days. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so they do some subgroup analysis as yep. well. This is specified subgroup analysis. Oh, it's mostly with the versus the low dose and uh, standard dose. So we already spoke to those um, things. Uh, but this yeah. one actually compares like the eight in the similar age categories, I believe. Um, yeah, age categories. Uh, but it's also because you said they had different intervals between their doses as well, mm. right? So again, I, again, you could read a lot into these things, but the best way to read it is just against the primary efficacy yes. endpoint, right? <laughs> Saying that. Um, even though there's different intervals between the, the first dose and the second dose, right? And even though there are low doses and, and standard doses, it doesn't um, negatively affect the, the the base efficacy too much, right? Still mostly effective vaccine. Uh, of course, the details of that, like it's a, there are actually quite stark uh, changes that we're seeing there, right? But um, again, these are smaller groups now that we've, 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 uh, cordoned off to do subgroup analysis on <clears throat> yeah okay uh, okay moving on to that. move on to immunity after the first so, sorry 
this I find interesting, right? These are the secondary endpoints um, in a table. Uh, so you can see here, right, they have primary symptomatic, that's the big one, but then they have this non-primary symptomatic, they have any symptomatic, and then they have asymptomatic. Uh, I think this is interesting. I'm waiting, again, because it's interim, I feel less interested, right, in seeing this information, especially knowing that that the one where they're going to get all their asymptomatic information come through is later. This is kind of like the press release for their, right, the rest of their data. But, you know, I love it. Like, I do think that there's some promise here to say that this vaccine has have some effect on asymptomatic uh, COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, so that brings us to the next table where um, they look at hospitalization. Um, there's not very, and there aren't very many num high numbers in this. So it seems to be a very small sample. But it's but what you see is quite good. It, what we see is uh, the yeah. only like two in the vaccinated group were hospitalized compared with uh, many more in the placebo group. Um, and this is this is actually a really good illustration of what secondary endpoints are good for, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can imagine if there was like the the most rigorous, right, like uh, standards, statistical standards applied to this endpoint, it would mean we would have to treat a lot more people before we knew if our vaccine was effective or not. Right. Because we because like severe disease is a subset of of regular co of COVID disease. Right. And so it means that if we want to use this as like the most rigorous one, we'd have to see way more cases. Right. In order to hit the right numbers. Right. And the right cutoffs. And so, you know, I think as well, I'm happy that this because it has an effect <laughs> of reducing all disease. <laughs> yeah. Uh, excellent. Um and just to wrap it all up, and again, this is just interim, we have table S7, which is predefined adverse events of special interest. So uh, this is just one of their safety tables that they pulled out. Um, but I, 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 I thought it was the best one because this is like, of all the adverse events, there were ones that they were worried, very worried about based on both the history of using this particular vector as well as... Um, what they would imagine, right? Like could be different uh, serious side effects that could occur. Um, and the profiles look pretty good actually between the two here. Yeah, I mean, one thing I'd like to pull out is uh, the BAERD, which is Vaccine Associated Enhanced Rep Respiratory Disease, something that they were very worried about. Mm -hmm. and, and essentially they, because uh, this is something that they'd seen in previous models with SARS-CoV-1, so they've seen it in animals where, uh, and the problem is trying to spot this in SARS-CoV-2 is difficult because we haven't seen anything like this in SARS-CoV-2 because there wasn't a vaccine before. So what would yeah. a vaccine enhanced respiratory disease? So they they like try to sat down and try to predict what would they see. So what they were looking for were non-specific antibody responses and a specific and an immune response that's also non-specific to to COVID-19. <laughs> and so they and the thing is that's very challenging about this, this is that these are also hallmarks of severe COVID disease or very so. Yeah, yeah, because like in severe, we get that like big immune response that fills up our lungs, right? ARD and so forth. Yeah. So how do we know that the vaccine is making that non-specific? But they yeah. chose antigens, right? They chose like if they saw more antibodies towards this thing, right? Because they yeah. just put spike in, right? They didn't put other stuff in. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And the data showed that the people who got the meningitis vaccine tended to get more of that severe COVID disease, which is what you'd expect if this if there wasn't any antibody dependent enhancement and this was about just measuring the severe disease. Um, so I just want to make a, a point of that because because from the state you might end up with a crazy idea that oh meningitis in, makes you more susceptible to COVID, but no, no, that's not that's not it at all. It's just yeah, it's I mean you yeah, can't really it's, yeah. It's those people like I mean this is this is the beauty of vaccines, right? Is that they're directing it's it's our hand, it's the human hand. <laughs> man, we got all our hand analogies here, but like, it's the human hand coming in and saying, this is the immune response we think is the best, right? Yeah. Like, like we're urging our body to have this immune response versus another. And so if you're just getting some other vaccine, right? Like that, that human hand isn't present. It's not directing us to a different vaccine. And really what we're seeing is, is a wild type rate right of like wild type SARS-CoV-2 right like giving us whatever crazy immune response it wants to give us of course that's evolutionarily benefited the virus itself right and so yeah you'll get you'll get those crazy rates <laughs> yeah and another thing that we, we probably want to address is that I mean there are a couple of times where this trial was stopped due to transverse myelitis and going into it there there were 
three cases they talk about. So one was a yep. ca- was in the COVID vaccine group, and they found it was actually in a case of undiagnosed multiple sclerosis. Mm-hmm. And another one was in the meningitis vaccine group, and there was one ca- case was of unknown cause that might have been related to the vaccine. So it basically that leaves us with like maybe one case out of yeah it leaves us with one case at the end of the day in all those three news things that we heard in this table only one case makes it here because of that investigation when they paused the trial they really were afraid because um that's again from the history of using these adenoviruses there was oh this could be a very dangerous thing that could happen okay turns out it's not it's (laughs) when we've tried it in the larger population it seems it seems uh that it's a very low risk yeah. Still a risk, but a very low risk. So it's essentially one case where they don't know what the cause is, so they just are assuming it's caused by the vaccine. But it could be for any... I mean, uh, to put it into perspective, there are also four non-COVID deaths, 75% of which occurred in the control arm. So there are homicide, <laughs> uh, a homicide, yep. blunt, a, a blunt trauma, and also a road traffic accident. Uh, but yep. it doesn't mean that, that getting the COVID vaccine will protect you against those things. There's, there's just a random... <laughs> Absolutely background of just death that happens anyway that's not related yeah. to covid so for all sorts of reasons yeah right yeah even coincidentally reasons that might align with a reason that we we're afraid of yeah. <laughs> that came from the technology <laughs> so yeah absolutely I, I think that that's it's tough right like um sometimes parsing through some of these statistics right because it's very much like there's going to be reports from all these different things but like yeah how does how should we understand that right as the personal risk to us um and and i think the profile looks looks very good from yeah. what we're seeing in this interim analysis and this is like not just one trial this is like two trials conducted so, with slightly differently with different populations and that's mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. Im- important and you i mean it's almost like they are looking to see like test it to its breaking point essentially to see where so absolutely i mean this is what we want this is why we ask for phase three trials right like this is why we've been waiting in some ways and not jumping the gun and just giving it to everybody because it gives us um some statistical backing and a large enough data set to even to at least begin right to 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 say what is safe um and, and why and I, I think it's ready, but of course, let's see the interim. This is just the interim, and so, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it looks safe enough. It's been through multiple tests in different populations, and it does seem to meet the threshold for a vaccine that works. I mean, I mean, yep. basically so, what we're hoping for. Once, once they finish their data collection, that's all going to be wrapped up and sent off to, maybe it's already wrapped up, right, mm. and sent off to the regulatory agencies, and hopefully we'll see uh, their approval of this vaccine uh, at, soon. And also that asymptomatic data. I, I'm so excited to see that. Yeah. <laughs> ah, so uh, yes. yeah. Now we're going to move on to our second uh, trial of the of the day, the BNT one six two B two, an mRNA vaccine, which has received widespread approval for use and has been given to people as we speak. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Again, it also delivers a spike blueprint in the form of uh, mRNA, and it's delivered in some nanoparticles. And in the same way the Chadox 1 behaves, it also activates the immune response, giving those bad hands to the, the cells. <laughs> yeah, alerting the body to the presence of potential bad, creepy hands in the body. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, and so and we've talked about it before, there are subtle edits to the code that have been made to ensure the stability of the vaccine candidate, and they use nucleoside analogs as well. So these are things that look like RNA particles, but they, they, they read like RNA, but they aren't broken down the same way. So that means that they can stick yeah. around in the cell a bit longer. Yeah. And I think they're also um, not as immunogenic as RNA because, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think we may have touched on this before, but it's weird to have different, like, certain amounts of RNA around the cell that aren't, like, properly uh, hostified, I guess is what we'll say, right? Um, and so, yeah... It's a, th- that's also a, a thing that they're trying to uh, prevent some strange immune responses that they don't exactly want. And so we have figure one. So this is this is a public. This study is published, um, and this study is done, right? And this vaccine is being given to people. So um, the way it, it just it's a lot more wrapped up. I would say, right? Like we felt this when we were reading it. It's a it's a much more wrapped up paper, um, in the sense that. Um, they're not going to show us any more information, right? Like what, what they're showing us is 
what uh, they think that the public needs to know, right, in order to um, feel confident that, you know, the, F, the regulatory bodies have already seen the whole story and this is safe to go in. Um, and so we won't see any changes to this. We have the full amount of participants and we can see all the people that didn't even get randomized. Maybe they didn't meet eligibility. They withdrew. Um, there was uh, maybe they had some adverse events like earlier in their own health stories. Right. They get right. removed. So then that leaves us with uh, still quite a few people. <laughs> um, of which a hundred don't even get vaccinated because they don't want to consent to uh, the the vaccine. So I guess they backed out last minute. They didn't realize it was going to uh, require them to consent to a vaccine. <laughs> yeah. um, and <laughs> I don't I've know why, right? Like I've literally had scientists who don't consent to. So I work in an, uh, in a scientific journal. I've had scientists who weren't willing to consent to to publish their paper. They they submitted to the journal and paid for. So it's stuff that happens. Last minute. <laughs> Yeah. People get frightened when they get given paperwork, and they they, yep. they sometimes you need to take the time to explain it to them. Or sometimes, if you're dealing with a vaccine, you need to just rush off to someone else who actually wants the vaccine. I mean, yeah, exactly. But not but not too many people are left are are, are missing from that. Uh, that leaves us with uh, forty three thousand four hundred forty eight, which get uh, assigned to either get the placebo or the vaccine. Um, and then from those two groups, again. Right now we have uh, people who withdraw, people who like have other health issues that conflict and so they get disqualified. Um, if people get pregnant, some people die, oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> um, all those people are removed from the analysis. Um, and uh, then there, there leaves us with two more groups that are ready to get the second dose um, of, of either intervention. And uh, once again, we have more people they are removed and that gives us our final analysis set. <laughs> Yeah, and this time around there wasn't any like dosing issues because uh, it's all been made in house by Pfizer. They they don't go into any detail. They just say that there are two processes. Process one, which is used for the inis initial doses, was their like kind of research dose, and then process two, which they did later, which was basically for batch doing like things at a much bigger scale. Um, I think it shows us how. Uh, you know, everyone's been talking about, oh, it's moving so fast, right? That's a very at-risk type thing to do, mm -hmm. right? It means that they've created a manufacturing process to make a lot of vaccine, and they try to fit it in into this trial too. Like, oh, let's also make sure that <laughs> uh, uh, we can even give it in the in the clinical trial, yeah. um, and that will give people more confidence <laughs> that our manufacturing process is going well as well. Yeah, I mean, part of the reason for the delay in the previous trials because they had to leave time to have the Maxi manufacturers make up enough vaccine for the trial, so it seems like they didn't have that much that problem here. This, I mean, this is only one trial, so it's not. Yep. So there weren't, but yeah. Um, uh, and uh, then we have the table one, which gives us our demographic breakdown. Uh, what do we see? It looks like everything's looking pretty similar between the two groups. They don't mention the number of healthcare workers included in the, in the analysis. Uh, this trial is also more U.S. focused. Uh, there are some hospitals in Germany, Turkey, South Africa, Brazil, and Argentina. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I wrote that down in my notes. Uh, they also have an obese cohort, which is really important, as I in indicated before. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is balanced. Yeah. Too. Yeah, but again, obese uh, of a very specific, right? Like, how much of that obese cohort overlaps with the Argentina cohort, right? Like that, that would be like, right. So like, again, this is like very specific for, um, yeah, a demographic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we don't know where they come from. I mean, I don't want to make any U S correlation to <laughs> obesity jokes because I feel like I've already did yeah, that. Yeah. That's, that's the dead horse for sure. <laughs> and yeah, other countries can be obese now. We're like Western lifestyle spreading everywhere. So yeah, um, it's true. OPC for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I guess I guess maybe something to point out here is that like, you know, this is um, because everything's all wrapped up, right? Like we're we're just seeing a lot less of like the inner workings of how everything was done, right? And some of those things we might see that if we dove into the protocols. We might see some of the more specific information, like like just what we were saying, how much of the obese cohort can be found inside Argentina. I think that might be there, but it also might be behind the proprietary wall now. Uh -oh. Yeah, I think that that is also something that just happens, right? Like it's not important enough to report. Uh, regulatory bodies have presumably looked at it and have 
put their stamp of approval on it. There's not a lot of incentive anymore to get that information out there, right? I think that that's a, that's a point that I kind of want to make yeah. because, you know, I work, I see this all the time, right, in my job. It's just like there's incentive to show information only so much as you have to get past the bar right. of getting it out there in the world. Once it's out there, the information is kind of like, okay, we're done. It's it just, just sell it. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so now we're going to move to local and systemic events. Now this is going to look yes. very different from the other ones because they were using the meningitis vaccine as a placebo control, whereas this one time they're using saline as a control. Mm -hmm. Which means there's going to be just a lot less of mm. things. And actually, it actually makes it more difficult, I would say, to use saline to, to disentangle the effects of adverse events because of the vaccine itself. Yeah. Right? Because now you're just like, this is just saline. <laughs> like, uh, there's a lot of things that could happen physiologically speaking, right, giving an actual vaccine that you could help discount some of the stuff you see. Um, but yeah, I mean, what are we seeing? I, I would think like injection events for sure. There's definitely always more injection events with a vaccine. Yeah. Uh, and you can definitely see that, right? Because you're, you're, you're in that spot. The concentration of the molecules is a lot higher. <laughs> um, bodies aren't always happy with that. <laughs> I mean, the interesting thing I noticed was the older age group seemed to see much milder side effects. So, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and than the younger age group. So I guess there's a millennial joke in there somewhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Is that... Uh, yeah, I guess they do see... It's not that much less. Not Are you much. talking about local events or the systemic events i mean actually there's mostly like for the local events so the yeah. injection site trauma and there's a little bit there for for like the systemic events in in comparison but yeah yeah um i think for, to me it's to me those numbers are very minor i mm. think but again i don't know they're not really showing us in a way that makes it easy to compare <laughs> between yeah. the two <laughs> it's yeah. just kind of like blocks of color it makes us you know this sort of data I, I mean i like it because at a glance you can just look and be like everything looks the same right like it's the same across this north south axis and it's the same across this east west um, axis i i personally hate stacked graphs i feel like uh -huh. they, they they were birthed in hell and they'll go back to hell eventually just because <laughs> they, they obfuscate some things yeah I think. They, they... um in in the fir in the second dose of the younger group, yeah, there are more severe uh, severe temperature events. Yeah, right. Which, that happen again. That's both a good and bad because that kind of could indicate that there is an immune response happening. Uh, mm -hmm. But then it happens as a placebo, placebo group as well, so it could just be sensitization just gener generally. But it, I mean, one one way to look at it is also that the older group might have slightly less activated less immune cells yeah, their around immune so is slower down yeah so that means that like yeah you inject them with something and the body's like oh we could deal with that or we could just try to maintain the ship that we would be maintaining for years <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh yeah but all in all right like um not a very high amount right these are are these oh yeah these are percentage of participants mm. um Oh, so actually they are bracing us for the fact that there will be injection site reactions, right? Mild or moderate injection site yeah. reactions for so all. Fatigue, <clears throat> chills, I guess. Are the, but yeah, I mean, I mean, every vaccine has like some injection site reaction because I mean, just the same as like a cut would also get some kind of reaction. So you, you would expect Absolutely. something like that. But the other, yep. the other things are yep. interesting. It yeah. Oh no. And and a bit of systemic event uh, mm. for most as well. Yeah. Just just some. Right. It's only mild or moderate, which is not a lot. Yeah. 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 Great. One. That's the first one. Those are probably those are the ones that you'd want to see in a chart. Because mm. <laughs> you just I, to me, I just want to see the details of those a little more. Right. Um, but yeah, that's cool. And the next one drills down a bit more into participants reporting at least one adverse event. Ah, so this is, oh, right, but this is just the cutoff of that one adverse event, yes. right? Uh, how many people hit that? And so, yeah, this this is the similar rates that we were seeing in the Chadox one, right? This is, like, pretty low rates, um, but there are there's a slight elevation, right, for any event, mm. um, yeah, related. Not, a, yeah, some in severe. It's small. Yeah. Uh... I, I, to me, I just want to see the... To me, this is like not as informative. I like to see the lists of things. Yeah. 
the lists are always the best because like these are like rare events in some ways i actually think that the big number is good for the quantitative understanding but the list is good for the qualitative understanding mm. right where you can be ah oh, this is what they were looking for this is what they were worried about right it gives you that sense of like what the intent was behind even the investigators that go through it right uh but anyways yeah Here's, here's the meat and potatoes, right? <laughs> the primary efficacy. So again, this is, they're, they're actually, they have a more forgiving um, window, right? Yeah. They're going up seven days post-dose. Mm. So that means that they're excluding fewer, right, people from their trial, right, at the risk of, right, that the, maybe the vaccine hasn't fully established itself during this time yet. Yeah. That's, that's. Uh, that's what they've done here. Again, NAAT confirmed SARS-CoV-2 with at least one of the following symptoms. And they have a larger list because they were using a more expanded uh, version of, of that. Uh, so fever, newer increased cough, newer increased shortness of breath, chills, newer increased muscle pain, newer loss of taste or smell. You know, the other thing that I, I about this that I thought was interesting is that they're also using language that's easier to understand. They're less academic, right? Yeah. This is more for like, marketers and like the public and like right this is their flagship you know journal paper where they can tell people our vaccine's wonderful yeah i mean the, the original paper the, the astrazeneca paper was written by the oxford group so it is a lot more academic a lot more like transparent but this one is written mm -hmm. by profession by like like pfizer and biointech basically yeah so yeah. i mean which are they're they're professionals just in a very different way right they're professionals in uh, creating effective drugs and bringing them to market, right? Yeah. <laughs> Getting people on board with uh, with that. And so anyways, um, diarrhea and vomiting. So a little bit of an extended uh, sy symptom uh, uh, plethora, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, again, it has to be with that PCR, with that uh, NAAT confirmed uh, SARS-CoV-2. And we're seeing some great uh, effective numbers here on their yeah. table. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the interesting thing in comparison is since the, the AstraZeneca had much more stringent guidelines, is it possible that they might have missed some of the things that, like the diarrhea or other treatments? For sure, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, those people just weren't included in the same, right, in the same net. And, uh, and so, yeah, maybe they don't see the same high numbers because of it. Um, so that's why, like, you know, when we see all of these vaccines that come out, uh, it really is not compare. It's like comparing apples and oranges in some ways, mm. right? Because like they were all done in their own way. They they each show, uh, in of themselves, that they're good enough to be a vaccine out there. But as to in terms of like head to head, which one's better? It might be a wash actually. Yeah. We, like it's really hard to say. This is something that came up too. You know, this is like something that comes up always in science is that you only see what you test for, mm. right? Like you only see what you test for. And so, you know, it matters all of these different things. You can get really good numbers just because they had a better way of like formulating that test, right? Um, and that's all it is. That's all the numbers are really, right? Of course, we want to make sure that the reason why they collected those numbers makes sense, right? Mm. A priori, right? Because otherwise that could indicate like sort of like fudging the numbers behind the scenes. But once it's all said and done and assuming that these people did their work at the highest standards, all of the groups, right, are doing the work at the highest scientific standards. Yeah, it's you don't really compare between the two. And that's why, sorry, I, now, now I'm ranting a yeah, little bit. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. This but, is the time for you to rant. Rant, rant, yeah. rant. That's why, that's why in the United States, right, there very rarely you'll see advertising materials that do head-to-head -head comparisons, mm. right? Because it's not allowed. <laughs> the FDA will not allow, like, that type of speculation, right? Because unless you've seen the head-to-head -head actually, right, inside of a patient population, it's all speculation. It's yeah. all speculation, right? And of course, that's to the chagrin of drug drug companies because you want to be able to say we're better than them because X Y Z. Um, and so sometimes it gets confusing when you're reading ads. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky in the UK where we don't get ads for for medicines. Although it's funny yeah. going the the fast speaking person at the end of American ads is the best part of them though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't understand how anyone's supposed to parse that information. Really, what you get is the emotion of the, of the commercial, right? And that's that's all. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, so this is not to diminish the fact they, they, these these look really good. So eight in so like great. the vaccine group, one sixty two in the placebo group. This looks really uh, effective. Yeah, um, I'm very happy. Very happy this vaccine is making it out there. Yeah. Um. So I think what is 
the next table, table three, subgroup analysis. Yes. Now, here is something that we can really dive into now. We can't when the study is still going, mm. right? Because here they've like, this is this is everything they're going to get, right? And, uh, and you can look. And so, like, what, what did they do? Like, um, first of all, I guess, how many people did they have in those older age bands? Yeah. Right? Is like a really important thing to think they about. quite a lot in the older, older age bands. Yeah, and... quite a few. 10,000 people, maybe half of the people are over 55 years old. Oh, I see. No, that's over 55. Yeah, that is that is the number. I was adding the two together. That doesn't right. make sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is the number over 55, 7,500. <clears throat> yeah, and as you go to the older age groups, that number uh, gets smaller. But also, it's quite good that it looks like it's effective in the over 75 group. Yeah, it looks like their efficacy results actually hold through those, those age bands, which... Yeah. That's great. I mean, that's really that it makes me very happy, right? Like I and again, this makes sense because um, if people have been paying attention to the news, they are using this vaccine in with the most vulnerable, right? Like right. I heard on the news that Sir Ian McKellen got the vaccine and yes. he was happy. <laughs> Magneto lives. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you know, like I'm happy. My grandmother, she's in a long-term care home, right? Like she's mm. gonna be one of the first to get this vaccine, um, and that that should relieve people to know that, like, in those locations, uh, we we should expect, based on this data, the same efficacy levels, right, that they saw in their full groups uh, in those groups as well. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, I mean, the the low, there are no low numbers in the group, so you don't get the kind of you don't get the kind of sensitivity to rare events that you would get in the other groups, but it still looks really, really good. So it looks like 100% effective. So that's... To me, I'm not interpreting it gets better over those different yeah. things. Right? It's, it's also like, yeah, the groups are getting smaller. <laughs> yeah. I mean... Um, but just seeing it at the same, around the same number, right? To me, that's like the, the feeling good about it. I mean, one thing that I'd like to... Like, how do you feel about the ethnicity groupings here? Because, um, it's like the the terms that they're using. I mean, it's more like the fact that, like, in the baseline data, like Asian was a separate group, and now we're we're kind of grouped into all others, and yeah, kind of uh, yeah. like kind of disappointed in that. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think because they probably want to show like the high amounts, mm. right? They're looking at those thousand amounts. Asian, oh yeah, it was only eight hundred. Yeah, I think that is definitely an optics type of thing, right? Yeah. Like. Where it's like all others still feel good, right? But actually, if you're all others and you're one of the smaller groups, like who knows what's going on in there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it might not look. It might not look good. And I mean, even being group. I mean, because I guess me and you would both be grouped in the Asian group. I'm not sure, but. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I definitely. Yeah, it, with these groupings, I believe I would be all others. Yeah. Asian. Yeah, <laughs> I believe I'd be all others as well. So it's weird because in the UK and the US, the definition of who is Asian is different. So. It, oh so much so and, and it's like not not incredibly helpful as well basically what i would say is if one group seemed like they stood out and it was uh and you could actually like pin it down to some sort of genetic variation then there might be some sort of host issue going mm. on right like some sort of immune widespread immune thing but like yeah otherwise yeah. whatever but <laughs> yeah that's just like a nitpick picking a tiniest nit off of this thing so it's <laughs> overall it's it, they have a, a very small Brazilian cohort yeah. uh, compared to yeah the other one that we saw. Um, but again, numbers seem like they hold they hold well uh, across all the different subgroups. So the subgroups aren't super interesting. I think age was the most interesting subgroup yeah. in this table. Um, but yeah, again, it s supports this idea we have an effective vaccine on our on our hands. Um, if we dive into table S four, we get to see some. I guess more curious uh, subgroups, right? Yeah. Uh, co comorbidity, um, <clears throat> and so there we're looking at, I guess, at risk. What are oh obese? It's the obese comorbidity. Yeah. Really. So they break it down into like like under sixty five and over sixty five obese cohorts, which I found quite interesting. Um, and the thing is, like, it seems like in this case, like, because all the numbers seem the same, same right? Yeah. But then, if you look at the confidence intervals, uh, over sixty fives tend to like be that age group tend to have like a much lower bound on the confidence interval. That could be yeah. due to the experimental group that they were assigned to. So it could be just due a numbers issue, or it could be that variation. I mean, that lower <laughs> twenty 
27.1 as a lower confidence interval to 100 is like uh that's kind of wild that's yeah. <laughs> basically that's very messy data is what it's saying right like uh yeah it looks all the same but really can you say anything about that group right given how large it was i actually think it's uh low <laughs> so it's one of those cases again where it's like okay the indication is there but it's also pretty messy data yeah there's a lot of variation in that group and that could be because of the different comorbidities in that group so there could be an entirely and other interaction that's messing with the data absolutely absolutely which also makes sense that also follows logically from that group right it's like older you have a lot of other pre-existing health conditions that come along with it only takes a few people with like really bad health conditions to kind of throw the whole group into like flux like that yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but generally, it seems to be okay. Uh, slide 34, the, give us graphs or give us death. Yeah, That's... yeah. And once again, this is they're also looking at after a single dose here um, in their graph. Because I think, yeah, it's after dose one. So dose two happens along this whole timeline. <laughs> and so yeah. all these events are accumulating even before the second dose. Yeah. So <clears throat> that little inset graph is basically the first 20 days of the bigger graph. They've blasted up much higher so that we can see the uh, events that happen after the first dose. Um, so, uh, yeah, it covers the number of infections in the 21 days between the primary and va vaccine and the booster. And there are doesn't seem... Hold up. Uh, I've lost Danny briefly. Uh, let's see if I can get him back. Uh, okay. Oh, I'm going to wait this out. I'm going to note this down so I can edit this out later. Okay.
Okay, for anyone tuning in, I've just lost my, my co-host. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Hey. Alright. Uh, oh, wait, one second. Sounds check the, the stream settings to see whether everything's, like, back, back to... Hello? Yeah, hello. Yeah, Can okay, you hear me? right, cool. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the internet tried to shut us down. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> uh, we were just looking at... I had to reboot my computer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, we're on figure three of the... the Moderna, that's uh, another Moderna, so BNT B6 paper. BNT B6. Sorry, sorry, no, sorry, no. Uh, I, I, I keep getting the name of it. Safety and efficacy of the BNT 162B2 mRNA COVID vaccine. Um, gotcha. Second, let me just open up the. Okay, yeah, should be good enough. PDFs to take up a lot of like, internet RAM. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I thought I had. I had restarted just earlier. I thought it was okay. We're still streaming though now. Yeah, we're still streaming. So I decided <laughs> okay. to keep the stream running throughout the technical issues. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> you... oh, sorry for leaving everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we'll just chop it all out it's, like, when we post. It's all right. I had my this is fine background and. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, we were just. I was just. I was actually zooming into the graph so I could see it more clearly. <laughs> I could see the numbers, and then everything just stopped, and I was like, oh, right. Yeah. I realized we don't really have a good way of talking to each other without the internet around. Yeah, okay. this is why I'm getting a, a high-spec gaming PC, to read PDFs while doing the stream, because <laughs> my current computer can't handle that. I'm literally reading off my notes on a different computer. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I guess what was interesting here is actually they give us a lot of insight to, like, what are they gaining by cutting out the the people that don't uh, between right dose one and dose two who test positive right because they have all dose one and then they have all dose one before dose two something like this I'm so afraid to zoom in again oh god oh god I'm um, doing it okay just, just go close to the I screen didn't... just move the screen close to your face and you'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah because they have right <laughs> um. Yeah, they have this uh, dose. Two, they have after dose one to before dose two, right? They have like a separate cohort for that, 
right, where they split it off in the graph underneath, right? And then they have dose two to seven days before dose two, mm. right, as a separate cohort again. And, and those people would not have been counted, right, in mm. their primary efficacy endpoint. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Um, so they kind of add in this idea that, like, oh, there's a bunch of people here as well. Um, but again, it. Well, some of it actually does. There, after dose one to before dose two, that cohort really significantly reduces their vaccine efficacy. Not to a point where it's like uh, too terrible, right? Like that's still a good enough vaccine to give to people, but but a little bit. <laughs> um, which is funny. Yeah. Basically, just means like there's a lot of people in the vaccine group that got covid in that period of time yeah i mean it's, it's hard really to to tell because like i know that with the chadox it, they also had a similar kind of group and that didn't seem to that seemed to show a difference early on but but things you can't really tell when someone's going to get the disease or not that's dependent on other factors that are outside of it so it could be right. that this was just during a massive spike anyway and and so it's it's hard to interpret too much from this data but i mean yeah, to interpret but again the takeaway I, mm. once again right try to attach what can you get out of it right is just that it doesn't, even if you include some of this messier data points right it doesn't decrease the vaccine efficacy so far that you wouldn't even consider using it right <clears throat> yeah uh so yeah i think the important takeaway from this is that there is a clear difference between like symptomatic COVID 19 in these two groups and the vaccine does look really good this is like the money shot of the paper absolutely absolutely yeah, which again, I, I like to see in a in a gra in a table actually, because I don't know what are you getting from. I can't read these. I mean, I I, I tend to, it tends to get like get a little bit of like about the timing of things and and hmm. also like kind of uh because it also like gives you like some rates as well. So sometimes uh, I mean if there are different phases of disease or or like outbreak, then that can change things. That you get you a little bit more of that temporal information that we're missing from a graph. But if yeah, you're just looking. But but I guess what I'm saying is I don't see it even just seeing this, right? To me, it's like, oh, they just – there's two things. One levels off. One keeps going. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, also, like, there are certain points where, like – so, I mean, I know in some graphs they, like, put in, like, certain points where they're censoring data as well. So it kind of shows you people mm -hmm. who aren't who – uh, the... yes, where people are dropping out. Yeah. yeah. Which, which can be very useful because if those withdrawals – correlate with um adverse events then you can see like oh around this time right is the make or break it time for people like right yeah coming on or off a drug but again with a vaccine that's not there's not really that same thing because like once you've gotten it you've gotten it right it's not like you have to continue taking it um much more afterwards <clears throat> yeah okay so uh and oh our last thing for Oh, no, we're not, our last thing for this paper, at least, uh, figure S5, which, again, mirrors that what we saw in the last one. Yep. Again, the secondary endpoint here, just looking at severe disease, this time they have all their data in. You can still see it's super low numbers, yeah. right, of people who end up getting severe disease. Um, because, again, they are a subset of people who also get disease, right, which is a smaller group, um, which is why they choose as a secondary. But it still looks good. looks like it prevents um, severe disease cases as well. Yeah. Um, so um, I think an important thing to su sum up is I. Yeah, actually, with this, sorry, I was just gonna say this is a strange one. I, actually, because it's such small numbers, and this is the end of the analysis, right? Like we can't hope to see any more numbers here. Mm. Then I would also say, but the conference intervals out of control. Like it goes down to negative one fifty two point six, right, around their vaccine efficacy. Yeah. So like, really, does this have does this protect people like this is this is the statement right like do you think this teaches us if the vaccine if you have covid would prevent you from getting the more severe version i mean I, I, <laughs> right yeah it's it's a difficult <laughs> thing to to say because there are such low numbers i think that like yeah with i mean things i mean in terms of significance at these low numbers it doesn't necessarily tell you much but the the difference does still like is still very convincing it's still yeah, shows there is yeah. a, there is, there's a difference yeah i would say i would say i my personal opinion if i was like interpreting this i would say yeah i think it does 
but by how much who knows yeah exactly <laughs> right? like, by how much, who knows it's actually a crapshoot so like better than nothing right again most things better than nothing i feel like that's what i've been saying to my parents with the vaccine <laughs> better than nothing you should get it right because it's better than not like just like going out there risk-free scot-free with anything um but in terms of like how confident you can feel that you're not going to get severe disease you probably still don't want to get covid <laughs> yeah <laughs> because there's no guarantee you won't end up in the severe disease category if you get it yeah and i think like this is a good point to actually try and sum up like try and talk about both papers because now we've come to the end of the second paper i mean what are your kind of thoughts on that um safe and effective vaccine i'm so excited that it's ready. I'm, I'm excited that it's ready um it's going to take a lot of time because i know like this is what we discussed what, what we're learning from these papers is if the vaccine works mm. <laughs> Right? It does it work? Is it safe? Is it effective? And I do believe that the papers communicate that quite well. Um, but of course, the the disease is more than just an effective vaccine, right? It's also a huge population of people who can all transmit it to each other. People who can't get the vaccine. We ranted. I ranted about this already. I'll say it again. People who are immunocompromised are not included in this study, mm. right? There there are people who get withdrawn for many different reasons, right? We saw in that cohort, right? Hundreds of people get like kind of removed from the analysis because they're not like <laughs> of of the right um, yeah uh, in the pre-specified um analysis yeah. i mean I, I did notice that like pregnant women were were excluded from the cohort yet i think this they are getting the vaccine either way so that's something that would we'd have wanted more data on but i guess that's going to be yeah. coming later I th Maybe what you would see, because the data is there, right? Mm. They just don't put them in this yeah. full efficacy cohort. So it could be it's just not very effective in pregnant women, right? It's safe, but it's not very effective. They're still included because better than nothing, right? Mm. I mean, that's just a I'm spitballing a little bit there, but that could be a regulatory decision that's being made, right? Yeah, and that's yeah. You know. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that the Chadwick's paper is a very much like, it provides a lot of information, and it's easy to get, like, drawn down into, like, the weeds with that, but I think it does say the, say the important things that we need to know about it, that the degree yeah. to which it works in different populations, and BN, and the BNT162B2 is also, like, it shows quite a lot of good data, and it's a much smaller, much more concise paper, which is why we've spent a lot much less time concise. talking on it. Yeah. And I think also like, but and to me like the important takeaways are relevant, are ev easily evident from seeing it, and I don't contest them, right? Yeah. That the vaccine works. It works in older people. I think that's a very important point that they make, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, and I guess I actually do think I do think it works in obese people. I I think that takeaway is yeah. is clear as well. Yeah. <clears throat> um. So yeah, I don't know. I. These papers fill me with excitement, um, but also worry because I don't want people to have these major behavioral changes just because we know there's a safe and effective vaccine out there. Um, because at the end of the day, there's more than just um, technology that goes into this. Are, are we looking at the multiple? Yep, <laughs> exactly. We are now on the Swiss cheese model. Yeah, and I think that's really important to keep in mind because herd immunity is, you know, presuming over 70% right, of people. And that is um, through vaccine and also, you know, unfortunately, the people who have been infected. Um, but that that herd immunity also doesn't guarantee that we won't be just transmitting disease amongst each other, right? It just means that we maybe won't be getting so much disease, um, but we could still be passing it on to those who don't have that immunity. So really, there's a lot of different things that we should be doing that we still have to be doing into 2021, yeah. right? Uh, <laughs> in order to keep uh, the population safe. Yeah, even though there is a vaccine, that isn't a reason for us to abolish all our other defenses. I mean, remember that the COVID mm -hmm. outbreak is already over in some countries. In some countries that haven't had a vaccine, they've managed to control it. I mean, the outbreak isn't going to be over just because we have a vaccine. It'll be gone when the last case of coronavirus happens in your area. This will take more yep. than just a vaccine. It'll take all the precautions we've been developing over the past year and a commitment to fall through on them. I mean, the vaccine uh. is a powerful new weapon in our arsenal, it's, but it's only the beginning of the end. And we have to make sure that we yep. keep everything else together if we need to yeah. get rid I, of it. Actually, I like that point that you were saying that other other countries have controlled the outbreak without a vaccine right so like uh yeah this is like you know for countries that maybe are having difficulty right for whatever reason controlling the outbreak um 
without this will be helpful, right? Because now some of their healthcare workers can can act, right? Like maybe with more confidence because they can feel like they aren't going to get it um, and put them out of commission. Maybe we can think long-term care centers, right? Won't have these like huge like explosions of death that kind of like roll through every once in a while. Um, yeah, it's nice to think that there will be the tool to help mitigate those risks, but there are still many more risks that we can be mitigating that we have been uh, that have we that people are telling us to mitigate, but you know, as probably as a whole, we aren't doing a good job. Um, just speaking from um, <laughs> my experience in Canada right now, coming from the states, um, and yeah, yeah, I mean, sure for I'm in the UK where they've invented an entirely new form of lockdown that we're in now, which is <laughs> tier four. There was only three tiers before that, but now we're in tier four. That is how uh, bad things are going. Um, <laughs> We, we've always, at least, uh, not in the States, but in Canada, they've always had four tiers. The worst tier is gray. Oh, wow. <laughs> after after it gets gray. That... <laughs> Just like dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think that this is going to be like, so, again, in terms of the COVID vaccine in the Olympics, which we've been covering for a while, uh, I've put up the overlay yeah. for the, that. Uh, Yay. In, in this event, I'm willing to declare a... A, a joint winner for for the both of these because they managed to get them out before we could other sh- both out. Oh, sure. sure. So this is. Sort of, uh, I, I mean, I, we we have you have to give a gold to Pfizer and BioNTech. Yeah, that's true. Right? For having the first vaccine out, they completed their trials. They even got their their vaccine in front of the eyes of all those regulatory bodies. Yes. Yeah. I mean. Yes, they're a company. Yes, they're hustling to sell that vaccine, right? But I mean, you know, it motivated them. <laughs> yeah, you are right. I mean, in the UK, we are going to people are getting the BioNTech vaccine as we speak, like mm-hmm. like officially. I mean, the, people are still getting the AstraZeneca vaccine as part of the trials, but that's not yet got the emergency use authorization. Uh, exactly, exactly. They have to get the gold for like first to market or something yeah. like that. Uh, but you know, the, the Olympics are full of gold medals. Yeah, <laughs> and. and think that just based on the two that we read there is that contender for best data uh, proving asymptomatic spread, yeah. right proving impact asymptomatic spread and you know astrazeneca vaccine is definitely high in those rankings um and once again we can't really give golds for overall efficacy because that's comparing apples and oranges mm. <laughs> it's going to be a really difficult way to like award those types of uh, um that type of uh yeah that's that's doing marketing that we're not allowed to do yeah (laughs) (laughs) um yeah so i'm happy i I think this was really exciting i was happy that we read this uh if our viewers are interested in um reading more right or asking us questions they should feel free to uh reach out to us yeah um we want to remind everyone that we're well we're very enthusiastic about microbiology we, we're only somewhat qualified i mean we got phds but it is possible that we didn't get everything right so science is about thinking critically and asking the right questions so if you have any questions or questions please let us know in the comments if you want to see the real papers those are in the doobly-doo um yeah, I, I agree. Uh, yeah, you can reach us out to us over Twitter. Um, and we believe that peer review is this process, right, which everyone can participate in. And so we hope that you have enjoyed listening to us <laughs> do our peer review process uh, and ramble about microbiology today. And if you think you have something to add, then please reach out. <clears throat> yeah, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, Danny. Uh, same here. <laughs> All right, well, tune in next week for more microbiology content. Goodbye. <laughs>